I want to talk a bit about testing and integration testing and how containers can help us with that. Um, before we get started, two quick questions. First, I'm from Vienna in Austria. We have a slightly weird accent. Who knows what my last name with one N would be or what would that be? Yes, horseradish, exactly. Um, that's always hard to remem remember my, my name. And the other thing is, where does my Twitter handle come from? Which is also related to my last name. Any guesses? Good old Rod 13, when you rotate the letters. And the nice thing is, rotating by 13, once you rotate again, you're back at the original. And it was used previously to, I don't know, hide movie spoilers or provide illegal software and only the people who knew what to search for were using that. Okay, anyway, let's do something about testing. Um, so I work for Elastic. Um, I don't want to talk about all the monitoring and logging products that we have and what we do. Um, to if you have questions about that, come to me afterwards. I'm happy to talk about that as well. But just to do something a bit out of the ordinary, I want to talk about integration testing today. So um, integration testing, why or tests? Who writes tests in general for their software? Is mostly everybody. Um, because normally the first step is, um, if you have a statically compiled language, and um, then it's often like, oh yeah, it compiles, so, so we're good. Um, at some later point, you come to the realization that, okay, unit tests, it works, um, we're good. Um, who is doing integration tests, just for, yeah, that's your, um, kind of the motivation why you should do integration tests is stuff like that. When you see, um, don't turn off the light switch, because it also operates the elevator. This is pretty much the like, unit tests work, integration tests probably don't work that well. Um, or you could have various other variations, like here you can see it's kind of, um, the tests kind of work um, or not, um, depending ho on how you see that. Um, other stuff is like, yeah, unit test works, integration test probably doesn't work. Um, or this one, I also like this one, this is for security. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can see there are, there are lots of reasons why you might want to do some kind of integration test and not just unit test to, to uh, test stuff uh, independently. So the first thing people are often trying is to mock stuff or kind of simulate to use the real thing. Who is using mocking? A lot of you. Who is using mocking for integration tests and not just for unit tests? Okay, that's far fewer. Um, depending on what language you use, there are various libraries. I don't really want to go too deep into that um, because my thing about uh, mocking is always, can anybody guess what will come on the next slide now? Unfortunately, this will be German. That is, at least that's what I've seen quite a few times in the past where people were mocking uh, for the integration test to test the real system. They were writing their mocks in a way that would always pass and kind of um, defeat the purpose of the mock. Um, so I'm, I'm personally not a huge fan for that. Mocking is fine for unit testing, but for integration testing, when you want to test the real thing, maybe you want to go a step further than just mocking stuff. Um, the next thing is using in-memory data stores. Who's using in-memory data stores? Okay, that's also quite a few. Um, for example, if you're using Java, my examples later on will be Java, but w whatever you're using, uh, there are various implementations for that to use uh, an in-memory implementation, um, which is nice, but once again, it's pretty much like it's the same, but different, but somehow still the same, or, or not. Um, and that is kind of the, the common problem again, uh, that while it's kind of close to what you're using for real reality, it's not really that close. And oftentimes you want to have the real system to be sure what you're testing is the real thing. And well, since it's uh, in memory as well, there are no containers involved, so I'll just skip over those and say, well, we're not going to do that today. Um, by the way, in Elasticsearch, we did support an ele embedded Elasticsearch version since, well, it's written in Java. So for Java testing, that was very convenient. Um, however, we got rid of that um, for multiple reasons. Um, so often you had like, dependency hell when you were including that. Uh, you could not create uh, the security or use the security manager. Um, and the main thing was people were using embedded Elasticsearch instances in production, which we always say, you, sh you never should do that. But of course they did. 
Um, and we kind of force people now not to use that anymore. Um, once again, no containers involved. So, um, and since we don't provide that uh, in a supported fashion anymore, uh, I'll also skip over that. Because, well, we want to test the real thing and not just some in-memory implementation that is closed. Um, so you could use the actual data store. Who's using that? Like an extra actual standalone data store. Who is using that containerized? Who is using that like properly installed, like the good old way? Nobody dares to raise their, oh, two, two dare to raise their hand. There's three. Um, so, so some uh, do that. Um, you have various options. Uh, you could do it, classical local installation. You could use uh, a Docker uh, instance or container to run that, or you could use a cloud instance, which is all nice, but yeah, maybe not that much. So let's quickly uh, jump into some code. I'll just use some text editor to make that slightly more visible. So I have a very simple Elasticsearch example. Basically, I'm connecting to Elasticsearch. Uh, doesn't really matter. Um, I will create an index. Um, I will store a document in that. And I will test if it's really there uh, in the end. So my total hits should be one since I've stored one document. Should be simple enough, right? Um, so uh, let's test that. What will happen? Well, it compiles. And it blows up because your system was not there. That's kind of the common thing that you see uh, when you have like a standalone dependency and suddenly your standalone dependency is not there, um, that all your, all your unit tests break. Okay, um, we have everything containerized, so uh, we can uh, just start my Docker container. Um, no magic or no real magic in that one. I just have an Elasticsearch Docker container running here. Um, the only thing that is here um, kind of interesting or relevant or that I always try to point out is, are we using Docker Hub? No. Does anybody know what you get when you do Docker pull Elasticsearch? You get an official image that is official not from us. Um, because official for Docker Hub often means Docker Inc. official. So we have never been involved in those images. And if you go to the Docker Hub page, it will actually tell you that the, the image is deprecated and you're stuck on the previous version. Because we've kind of told them we don't want that image around, so they kind of froze what they had but there are no, go no updates going to happen. So if you do Docker pull Elasticsearch, you will get five, six, whatever is the latest version in there, but new newer versions, and we're not involved in those, um, just as a general pointer. I'm using our official images, which, well, we have our own registry. Anyway, so um, while I've been talking, Elasticsearch hopefully has started up, which takes around 20 seconds or whatever. Um, so if I run my test, that should finally work then. So we'll quickly compile, uh, connect to localhost 9200, um, and then in the end it will tell me, okay, build success, we had the one thing that we stored. You can see somewhere we have like the ID of the document that we've stored. Um, since we haven't deleted it, we should still be able to find that, uh, but yeah. So that test is working. Generally, um, this is okay. Um, it's kind of the good old approach. Everybody knows that, no surprises. Main downside is um, stuff like if you have external dependencies and they are down, suddenly all your unit tests will break. And if you run tests in parallel, um, you probably overwrite the results from each other one. Who has had that, that the tests were kind of like writing concurrently? Um, because I've seen that a lot. Um, that, yeah, you can do stuff like you use a randomized database name or a randomized index name for us. Um, to kind of avoid that, but it's kind of best effort on maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. The other fun thing that we had uh, in previous examples uh, or in previous versions were, was that we were clustering by default by broadcasting on a local subnet, which had the interesting effect. I, I tried that for a training once and everybody was starting their local instance um, and it would automatically cluster for the entire training group. But people didn't really realize that. And that works until somebody writes something in and somebody deletes it. And then all the tests are kind of trying to run concurrently and nothing works anymore. Um, which is, by the way, not the worst thing. Uh, that auto-clustering, the worst case scenario is probably um, you VPN to production and have a local instance running. Um, you did not change the database name, which you always should do because we would always check like or only form a cluster if you had the same database name. But people had that, that they were VPNing to the production system uh, with the local node running. It would form one nice big cluster and then they thought they were running a command against the local host and then drop everything. Um, so 
don't do that. Uh, probably not the coolest experience to have. Um, the next thing you could do is you could run something in process. Um, so there is uh, a library from Germany called Flapdoodle. Um, they basically had a model. This is slightly before the container time, basically, when this came up. So what this does is basically it will figure out on your operating system, you want to run that whatever process, for example, Redis or MongoDB or, or MySQL, and it will know on your operating system, I need that binary. And it will basically automatically in the background download that binary and start it up as a server process, and then you can just interact with that. And at the end, it will just shut it down again. And whenever you change the version, uh, it will automatically download the latest binary. Um, so yeah. If you have run to run your tests like that, that will be provided. Um, they do have done either by themselves or by others quite some integrations uh, for tools. So you can, I don't know, if you want to use a relational database or console vault influx. Those services are all available. However, it always felt a bit dirty to me well, because it's trying to download the binary and then fork out the process from your Java process. Um, and it was not really very well contained. So if you had a port collision, it would not start up. Um, and it, you can just tell it's not really from the container time. It was slightly before. It was a nice idea or workaround. But with containers, this can be much nicer. So um, one, and also this doesn't support Elasticsearch, so I'm, I haven't built a demo around it. Um, the next thing that you could do is you could integrate the entire thing into your build tool. Um, so for Maven, for example, there is a Docker Maven plugin, uh, which does exactly that. And it does two things. Firstly, it can build an image when you run Maven tests. Um, and it can also run, stop and start the container that you want to run. So that basically covers the setting up and everything around it. Um, Starting at your own Docker file or building your own Docker file is pretty simple. Uh, you basically can provide either a classic Docker file uh, or an assembly. So here you basically reference a Docker assembly and XML if you like to write XML. And then it can build your container and you can run that. Um, but you can do that. Um, and just to quickly show you what is going on here. So here um, we have pretty much the same thing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in the right file. Um, I'm con connecting to my Elasticsearch instance. So you can see I'm connecting to Elasticsearch on localhost 9200. Uh, that's all pretty much the same. Uh, and we're running the same thing. So we are creating an index. Uh, we're storing a document in there. And then we're querying if we really have a document. So for your test itself, nothing changes. But in your uh, dependency management tool here, Maven, um, so you need your regular dependencies. Those are all fine. But what is new is that you have this Docker Maven plugin here. And basically, what you can do here, since I only use a default image, you don't have to build a custom image. Uh, you can just say, OK, this is the image I want to run. And this Elasticsearch version here, for example, that's kind of neat that you can reference that. Um, so I have re uh, defined the version here. I'm using that in the client version, so it will automatically match the exact same version uh, for my test. So you, you don't need to change your versions anymore, anywhere else. Um, this is pretty much what I have done in my Docker Compose file, which I, by the way, I should shut that one down so we don't have any port collisions. Um, uh, and then you just run it on port 9200. Uh, we check for a specific response code so um, that it's coming up within uh, 200 uh, in 60 seconds. Um, and we basically uh, stop and start that thing. So that should also be pretty simple to run. If I do that, will that thing work? Yes or no? Yeah, unfortunately, once again, it's not that simple uh, because this doesn't start my dependencies. And well, it will run the tests, but it cannot connect them. And it will fail because, well, uh, here you somewhere have um, connection refused. The dependency was not there. Uh, what you uh, need to do uh, instead is you can say, start my Docker container, run my tests, stop my Docker container, throw everything away. Um, but it is pretty neat because uh, everything is embedded and you don't need to have any external dependencies and manage them. So here you can see, OK, this is the image that we're using. And we're starting that container image. Um, it's waiting. So the waiting probably takes 20 seconds or so until my Java process has come up from the container. And as soon as that is up, it will then try to run my tests. And hopefully, it comes up and succeeds. OK, it has come up. 
Um, is it working? And that's all good. Um, so I have, this is really hard to read. Um, so you can see we have one Docker image, uh, uh, one, Docker sto one stop Docker process that was the one that I have started standalone. What do you think happens if I run my test like this? Which is kind of cut off. Um, just to make it more visible for everybody. What happens if I run my test like this? Docker start test. Yes, um, so this will do exactly what you tell it to do. Um, basically, it will start Elasticsearch, run your tests, and then you have like a spare instance running around. Um, so either make sure you always uh, run uh, the shutdown phase, or there's also a specific plugin to make sure you run a phase at the very end of, of your build process uh, to make sure you actually really remove that Docker container. So okay, once uh, our containers, uh, our tests have run and passed, uh, Docker PSA. And now you can see, okay, here I have my two minutes, um, no, 20 seconds. Uh, so this container has been up for 20 seconds and will be happily running forever. Um, so I don't want that. So let's do some manual cleanup and then we're good again. So that's also pretty automatic, but it's kind of like not as nicely integrated as you might want it. Um, so run that fail-safe plugin, which, yeah, there is a fail-safe plugin that will make sure that you actually garbage collect that Docker instance. The one, or you could have many dependencies that all of them will be removed at the end again as well. Um, the nice thing is it works on any plain Docker image you have. You don't need to customize anything or integrate anything, um, but you can. Um, the biggest downside is that you will have, since you run Docker start and Docker end at the end, you will have one instance for all your tests. So this is uh, not kind of limited to one specific test. We don't use one instance for a test and then throw the test instance away, which we probably could otherwise. Uh, but this is very global and kind of not as nice and it's kind of against the spirit of Docker that you reuse stuff that much. Um, so for that, there are test containers. Test containers are Docker containers that you kind of wrap into a dependency and then you can access that dependency directly and interact with that in your unit tests. And they can be, uh, you can spin up a new uh, instance of the container uh, for every test that you run. And it will be garbage collected automatically. You don't need to work any anywhere around that. Um, so test containers is generally um, a lightweight library that supports unit tests um, and supports these throwaway uh, instances for common databases based on containers. Um, if you want to wrap a service like Redis, for example, that would be the, the very minimal thing that you would need to do. So this is pretty much the, the Java code that you need to write. And out of that, you make a proper dependency, and then you can just use that dependency in your tests. So here you can see um, we're using the official Docker Hub Redis container version 3.0.2, um, expose it on that specific port, and that's pretty much all you need to do. Um, if you want to get the list, th these are like part of all that the containers uh, that we support, or th that they have offered or support. You can see there is, yeah, Postgres, MySQL, whatever. Those are all in there and you can use them directly. Um, Elasticsearch is not directly um, supported. However, luckily my colleague David has wrapped our official Docker images in some Java code. So I think he has written like 150 lines of code or so. Um, and he's wrapping that and then you can use that as a dependency directly, um, which is um, admittedly much nicer to use. So what do we have here? First off, let's start with the dependency. So you can see, okay, we're using our clients to connect. Uh, we do some logging. Um, this here is the dependency that we're interested in. Um, so this is his dependency, um, and that's pretty much all you need for that. Um, we're using one other trick here, um, that here in that resources, we're basically propagating the version of Elasticsearch that I have defined here down into our test. So we don't have to specify that version twice. 
so they are always in sync. So basically that file here is basically passing through whenever you run the, the test that will be filtered and your Elasticsearch version will be put into that one here. Um, and then in your tests, you don't do much more uh, than you would normally do. So basically here, um, here you're setting up that you want to start Elasticsearch. Um, basically you have a, an instance of Elasticsearch container with the specific version that you're passing in here. Um, you wait for up to 60 seconds for it to start up and then you run your unit tests. And after that, there's nothing else to do. So you're uh, establishing your connection. Um, at the end, you're closing both your client and the container. This will also get rid of the container again. Um, and in your tests, you basically just add your index, um, uh, create your data, check that the data is there and everything will work. So um, let's try that. Will that work? Hopefully. Let's see. Let's make the slide be large again. So you can see our test is coming up. Um, and now you can see, ah, we need an, uh, an Elasticsearch instance. Um, it checks, like, do you have the, the minimum risk, uh, yeah, requirements to actually run that Docker instance, um, which is starting up. And once again, probably 20 seconds or so later, um, this will be done. Okay, so it has spun up our Docker instance, and at the very end, you can also see um, uh, it stopped our container with the ID, which I don't see right now. Bless you. Um, but it, it, it throws away our Docker uh, instance at the end again. So if I run that, you can see, okay, we still only have that one instance that we have started at the very end, and there was no cleanup pro problem anymore around that. So far, so good. Um, so generally, you get one container per test. You can also reuse them if you want that for speeding up stuff. So if you have a static block and you just wrap the setup in the static block, it will be used for whatever the scope of that static block is. Um, so you don't always have to spin up a new instance because it might take some time, especially if you have a Java process and that takes 15, 20, whatever seconds to start up. You might not always want to do that, but you can, and it's just like being thrown away whenever you want. The main downside is that you need some customization or that you need to wrap whatever Docker image you have and want to use, uh, that you need to create that Java dependency um, to wrap that Docker image and then expose that and use that in your dependency management. But it's only like 100 or 150 lines of code or so, so it should be pretty simple and it will make the interaction much nicer afterwards. So, to wrap up, do we still need to discuss why we want integration tests? Anybody not convinced that you need integration tests? Okay, good. Then we can move on to um, why not, or at least in my opinion, but we can discuss that, um, why mocking is nice for unit tests, but maybe not integration tests because you want to test a real thing. In-memory data stores are kind of the same, but not the same, so I'm personally not a huge fan of using them for integration tests either. Um, actual data stores work, but yeah, it feels very legacy and it's maybe a bit more brittle than the other approaches. Um, the how is then kind of the trade-offs how you want to run your tests. So do you want to do it in process, um, to run the entire thing in process in that flapdoodle thing, the dependency that you've seen, um, if that supports your tool of choice, but then, well, no Docker, which probably for you at a Docker conference um, is a downside. Others might see that as an upside. Uh, you can integrate it into your build tool, making sure that the build tool will clean up at the beginning and at the end. Um, and the kind of cleanest solution, in my opinion, is test containers. And that's got kind of a lot of hype and buzz around it, at least in the Java ecosystem for testing. And I've seen that they started porting the, the dependency to the .NET world now as well. I'm not aware of any other systems that are supported or programming languages, but probably something similar will pop up sooner or later so that you can nicely wrap that uh, into your tool chain and then don't need to worry about any external dependencies anymore. Um, if you want to 
play around with the demos. It's really the, the minimal sets of what you need. I've put those together. Uh, I can also, or I will also publish the slides afterwards. But if you want to play around with the code, it's really like 10 files or so only. Um, that's where you can get the code to try it out. Shouldn't need any dependencies except for our Docker images, pretty much. Um, and then you're good to go. Um, questions? Or discussions, or does anybody strongly disagree? Um, by the way, before I take questions, I always take a picture so I can prove to my colleagues that I've been working. <laughs> because they don't normally know where I am. Smile, everybody. Oh, you're too many. Very nice. So, questions. I saw a couple of hands. Um, yes, please. I forgot. I'm sorry. Where is it? Ah. Oh. How do you uh, how do you run test containers inside a Docker build? I mean, so you have Docker you mean inside the, the Docker. That you mean you have the Matroshka problem? Yeah. That you you have one inside the other. Um, so honestly, we don't because well, we want to test our our solution and and then we don't like run Docker container in Docker container. Um, that is admittedly a downside if you want to test the final artifact. I think there is no easy way around that. Um, which is cool for testing without containers. Um, watch out. Um, how, what do you do if you want to customize your container? Um, for example, uh, uh, with the database and data preceded. Ah, with preceded data. Well. Um, if you just have an like example, it, uh, if you if you have like a static set of data, you could just yeah. build that into the container. Uh, you can just uh, define a, a Docker file. Uh, you mean for test containers now? Yes. You could just have a custom uh, Docker file and probably um, include test data in there as well, and just build your dependency around that. Then it's customized, and you will would probably push your Docker file uh, to Docker Hub. But you can reference any image. So in your dependency, yeah. you would just reference that or whatever, not maybe maybe not public Docker Hub, but some private registry. Uh, but wherever you push that image, you can just reference it from test containers, um, if you wrap it correctly, and then you can just use that. So for example, um, in, in our test containers, um, dun 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 dun. but you will have to build a Maven artifact as well that you can include. Yeah, wait, give me a second. So, um, Ah, I stripped those out. Um, so for example, our doc, uh, test containers are, are flexible enough uh, that you can pass in uh, another uh, Docker-based image at runtime. Mm -hmm. that, dep uh, that, that depends on, uh, give me a second. Uh, do I do? So here, for example, um, when you set up the container, I'm, I'm saying with version blah, whatever. Um, you could also, obviously that needs to build into the base image, but here you could uh, provide a specific image and override that. So for example, if you want to test Elasticsearch, but you want to uh, have like some static test data provided, then you could just uh, take our official Docker image, wrap that in your own Docker file, add whatever data or configuration you want to that, um, push that to some registry, and then reference it here um, to get that exact image back. And then you don't need to change the Java dependency. I hope that answers the question. Yes, over there. Maybe it's easier for you to throw that. Um, what is when you need something like a Docker Compose? So I want to test my service with my database. So I need two containers. Um, you will need to um, spin up multiple dependencies. I mean, since it's all pretty code driven, um, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm just setting up my one container, but this could be the Elasticsearch container, and then you could programmatically spin up the other dependency that you need. Um, since you don't re really need any other orchestration, since this is all code driven, you just see, okay, whatever you spin up here, and then afterwards you do something else. To, to have as many dependencies as you need. Obviously, it will make your integration test a bit slow at some point, if you have like 10 dependencies, but that's kind of the trade-off for integration tests. 
Sorry? So, well, I think it depends very much on the container. Since for Elasticsearch, we need to have the JVM and the Java process. For, for on my laptop, it probably takes uh, 20 seconds or so. Um, but that's like the 2015 model. So if you have a proper build server, it might be only a few seconds, but it will be a few seconds. If you have some, there are, for example, Nginx dependencies, I guess that will be pretty much instantaneous. So the, the main thing is here that will slow you down is the JVM. But if you have MySQL, Postgres, Nginx, whatever, um, the time will be nearly instantaneous and not like 20, 15, whatever seconds. More questions? We still have three minutes. No? Ah, over there, sorry. Please, please throw. Oh, very good. Uh, so as I can, s can see there, you're uh, randomly generating the ports. So I could also run multiple uh, integration tests in parallel. You can. Right now, I don't. Um, but yes, uh, you could, when you spin up the instance, um, you, you could, uh, you could uh, set the port as well here. So you, have, you, you could uh, generate the random port and then use multiple instances in parallel if you want to parallelize yeah, the because test. Because I think it's not a, a thing of uh, how I start my elastic search inside the container. It's more a thing how I'm mapping uh, the container port via Docker. Yes, how, how you're so binding um, that. Uh, could you switch back? So it uh, probably could uh, be done uh, where you start the container in Java code. Then. Yes. Um, I think we're exposing that. Um, so this is just a configuration thing. Since we're, uh, you can just, it's basically a parameter in the configuration of our Docker container. You can just say, okay, map to whatever port. Um, yeah, you can, you can totally do that, yeah. Okay. Um, and then randomize it and run them in parallel. And, and cross your fingers that you don't run into duplicate ports. So you have a possibility to start the Docker container on the first test and uh, close it down after the last test is run. So overall tests, not just for one test class. You, you mean with test containers? Yes. So if you have a static context and you have everything in that static context, yes. And how do you shut it down? No, 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 the, it will be shut down automatically at the end. Uh, basically the wrapper that you have makes sure what you start up and what you shut down, there's basically, um, the wrapper at startup what happens and at shutdown what will happen to, to your Docker container. Okay, so I just write a static block somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, this part here, you, you would wrap in the static block. Okay, and then uh, who calls the close method? Um, well, you have the after class and here you call your close. Yeah, but I don't want the after class. Well, the after class is run after the whole test class is run, and I don't have all my unit tests in one class. I have the cluster around. Uh, you can classes. also use before method and after method. Yeah, but they then are started after, uh, closed after each method. I want before the first test is run, start it up, and after the last test is run, out of all my test classes, shut it down. I think this is mainly uh, how the question is then how you structure to your JUnit tests. You just need the, the static context uh, from which all your JUnit tests start. So if you have like a base class with the context, then, then you cr can start from there and just branch out in your other tests. Yeah, I have to look into that. I'm not sure that would work. But this is, this is just a, the way how to structure your JUnit tests then. So JUnit has a method about when starting before the first test is run and after the last we, we test can is run over all, over all tests? I'm, I'm not sure. We need to check. No, 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 I don't think it's an annot annotation. Uh, you, you would need to like have like an, an Uber class and from there call out your all other tests. Which is maybe not very pretty, but Okay, so I define a test runner. Yeah, you, you have a custom test runner. And then I can't use my spring test runner, so. <laughs> there are some trade-offs, but in this case, I would rather blame JUnit for that. Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, I was interested if maybe someone no has no a solution we about that. No, no, this is just tied into JUnit, basically. This is okay. not extending G G Unit. Um. Okay, yeah, thank you.
for for reusing it everywhere, yeah. or, okay. Yeah. Uh, Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.